All right. Hey, everybody. Jordan coming to you from Jerome, Arizona. And tonight I want to talk about the principles of success. And these principles apply to any business. Um, so regardless of whether you're building a send out cards business or a promptings business, or if you've got other things in the works, um, these principles can help you with any uh, any business. And I was, um, a lot of you know the story. I'm just going to quickly tell it. I was living in that little garage there on the left. My rent was $200 per month. I had two roommates. <clears throat> they were living in the uh, house part of the, of that unit there. And and uh, they paid $200 a month each as well. I got the big room, which was the garage. I was 34 years old. I'd been in 11 network marketing companies in 10 years, never made a penny, never signed up a single person. And I joined my 12th company. But when I was living in that garage at 34, I had $36,000 in credit card debt on 22 credit cards. I was scared. I was stressed out, a little bit depressed. Had a broken down Jeep that had been in the street for two years because I couldn't afford to fix it. And I applied some things that I learned um, along the way. I applied some things that got me out of this garage and sent me on a trajectory of growth that I couldn't even have imagined. Um, and truthfully, as it started to happen, uh, it was a little surreal, almost to the point where I couldn't believe it was really happening. So, but I, after as many years as I had been in the process, and I'm going to share with you some principles that I learned that I applied to learning to fly helicopters because they apply to business. It's a great metaphor. So as many of you know, my office was the coffee plantation on Mill Avenue. I would uh, walk to work from that rental. I would go down to that coffee plantation and three days a week, I would work my business on my lunches. And that's where I built my first business. I was committed to giving it two years, two full years. After two years, I was making about $180 a month. It was the first time I'd ever signed up anybody in my life. And by the end of my third year, uh, by the end, towards the end of my third year, I was at, uh, I broke $30,000 a month and I went on to make $8 million with that company. So I'm going to share with you tonight some of the principles that I applied um, to my businesses. And I'm going to use my experience of learning to fly a helicopter. So here's what happened. I, you got to remember everything we do that we've never done before, even if we've done it for a long time and had no success, everything that we do that we've never done before is new, right? It's, it's something we've never done before. It's new. So it's typically not in our comfort zone. Flying helicopters is not in the comfort zone of people who have never flown a helicopter, including me. And so I was in my condo in Las Vegas and I saw these helicopters giving tours. And I thought to myself, it'd be so cool that when my friends came to town, I could say, let's jump in the helicopter and let's take a flight around the city and see uh, Las Vegas from the skies. And so I went on the internet and I found a, um, I, I searched for a training school for helicopters in Las Vegas, found 702 helicopters. I went down there and I told them at the age of 57, I want to, actually, I think it was at the age of 55. Yeah. I want to learn to fly helicopters. They kind of snickered because guys in their 50s don't go in and say they want to learn to fly helicopters. It's usually guys in their early 20s or women. There are a lot of women flying helicopters today. So I told them I wanted to do that. And I asked them, you know, how much would it cost? And I said, can I take a discovery flight, which is just a one flight you pay for 300 bucks. You go up with an instructor. They kind of give you an orientation and tell you what's going to happen. And then you fly and you even get to hold the controls. And then you decide whether you, that's their sales presentation, right? It's like their business presentation. And then you decide whether you want to uh, take lessons or not. Well, I did. <clears throat> Could never have ever prepared for what I was in for. And I told so many people I was going to go get my helicopter license that I couldn't really back out. I could have, but I would have had to come up with some really good excuses. And believe me, I tried. So I'm going to talk about how to fly in life and business. And the first thing, and this is something that most of you have not done, uh, most of you are playing small. The first thing is you want to take on a big dream. Taking on a big dream is the best path to rapid and personal and professional growth. So if you'll start there, even if you don't believe it's possible. And the truth is, when I went down to that school, even though I thought I'd give it a try, I didn't believe it was possible to learn to fly helicopters. For me, 
that was a massive, huge dream to take that on in my 50s. It got me excited. It got me motivated. And it got me scared out of my mind. And if your dreams don't scare you, then it's probably not big enough. Well, this dream scared me. And I took it on. And I'm going to share with you 10 lessons that I learned, 10 lessons that I applied to any business I'm involved in. And uh, here we go. The first one is investment. I had to invest $75,000 and 150 hours of my personal time, which means I had to give up 150 hours because I was already doing stuff during those 150 hours during the day when I wasn't sleeping. I had to give up 150 hours doing something else so I could do this. So I had to make some sacrifices, but I had to invest 75,000 and 150 hours of my time to be able to enjoy this dream. Just like you have to invest in your business, um, in personal development and events, tools. I thought I made corrections on here, but I thought I went in and changed these and, and, and made the edits, but I see that there's a, the parentheses is in at the end there. So <clears throat> I thought I did it. So you're probably going to see some others. There's another one right there. The second one is sacrifice. Um, I had to find 150 hours to the tune of anywhere from one to three hours a week. And then I'd be gone for a couple of weeks and come back and try and make it up. Uh, you'll need to make business a priority um, and other things will need to take a back seat for a while until you're fully up and running. And that's the nature of learning to do something that is going to take you to a new level in your life. And again, you may not want to learn to fly helicopters. Uh, you may not want to make $100,000 a month, but you might want to be able to just have a lot less stress in your life and be able to take vacations more often and travel. Or you might want to be able to take your kids or your grandkids places that you can't now because you don't have the funds. So it's a sacrifice in a sense in that you have to give up some stuff in order to make space for whatever it is you're trying to build. The third thing that I had to deal with was my fears. Uh, and the fears felt real. I had to face my fears. In fact, sometimes the fears were so big that I would start, my brain would start to make up excuses why I couldn't get down to the school that day. And sometimes I had to force myself to get in the car and go down there because there were, I knew there were things I was going to be doing that day that I was not super excited about because it was so far out of my comfort zone. I had to have faith that my instructors were gonna save my ass every time I do something stupid, which you always do. And so, um, this was something that if I wanted to fly, if I wanted to have the dream to fly, I had to face my fears. And uh, the more you practice, the more confident you get. And there's, there's absolutely, I don't know of any other way around it other than just to continue to do the things that you're uncomfortable with until you're comfortable with them. And, why, and this is the reason you got to have a big dream, because if your dream's not big enough, you'll throw in the towel. If your dream is big enough, if it's something that's really important to you and really exciting to you, you'll be willing to face your fears and overcome. It doesn't mean you won't have conflict. It, don't, it doesn't mean you won't question yourself. It doesn't mean you won't want to quit at times, but you'll always go back to your dream. Like, why am I doing this and why is it important to me? The fourth thing was practice. I had to practice the fundamentals in the air over and over and over again in motion, just like in business, you have to practice in real life. Uh, not just in the classroom. It's not like just going to training and hoping things happen. Practicing with real potential customers and affiliates, falling flat on your face over and over again. Heck, I fell on my face, flat on my face for 11 years before I may, had my first win in network marketing. I didn't have a single win other than I was learning. I didn't have a single win in network marketing for my first 10 years, 11 companies. So in order for you to master the skills you have to practice in real life, not just in a classroom or in a training. And so I went up week after week after week after week with an instructor. And every time I would screw up, they'd grab the controls and save me until I could get it over and over and over and over again. Number five is solo. At some point, I had to do it on my own. In fact, I remember this day. In fact, for a couple of weeks, I suspected this day was coming. And I, I was so terrified that, again, my brain was trying to make up excuses why I couldn't go in. And then I also knew that if I didn't go in and I didn't break through this, 
then that would mean that I possibly would never have my dream. And then I have egg on my face and I have to tell everybody uh, I'm not getting my license and come up with a good reason why I'm not. So, but here's what happened. I showed up, we were just doing a regular lesson. I was with Tammy Gillette, who was my instructor at the time. Tammy's an interesting story because Tammy was driving. Um, she's married and has a couple kids. And she was, at that time, she was in her early forties. She was driving in Vegas and she saw a billboard that said, helicopter instructors wanted will train. And she literally got the number, called them and drove directly to the helicopter school before she went home. And she told them she wanted to learn to fly helicopters. She was a mom, stay, not a stay at home mom. She worked and they signed her up. And within, I think it was a year she was teaching people and I was one of her st first students. So <clears throat> Tammy was, had taken me up a few times and uh, one day she said, okay, Jordan, you're ready. And I go, ready for what? I suspected. She said, land the helicopter. And I landed. You notice there's no doors on this helicopter. It was one of those days where we didn't have the doors on the helicopter. So we, so we, I, we landed the helicopter. Tammy just got out. So then it was just me and the helicopter. She said, okay, I want you to pick the helicopter up and do three patterns, which means three go arounds. And I was insanely scared. And I went and I did it. And when I landed, it felt great. I got the ceremony and I had my first solo under my belt. And then I started soloing all the time. And that's how you get, that's how you hone your skills. So uh, doing it on your own can be scary. It's the same in business. At some point, you're just going to have to do it on your own and not wait for somebody else to do it for you or pat you on the back and tell you you can do it. It's just at some point, you're going to need to do it on your own. It's usually sooner versus later. Number six is the fundamentals. There are things that you can't train for. So you learn the fundamentals, the basics, you know, and then uh, when you get served the twists and turns, the fundamentals carry the day. I like to think about my hang gliding days where I learned the fundamentals. But when you run off a mountain in a hang glider, there's things that have to do with weather and local, um, you know, climate conditions that can affect the flights and uh, your flight. And, and you've got to just be like you've done the fundamentals so many times over and over and over again through practice in real life that when you get served the twists and turns, you know how to handle them. And if you don't know how to handle them, you have a little failure and then you can go back and reflect and say, you know, what could I have done better? What could I have done differently to make this work? And even someone like Steve Jobs or Bill Gates, I promise you they had many, probably thousands of failures along the way, but because they, they were willing to fail and they were willing to practice the fundamentals over and over again, uh, they, they got stronger and stronger in their skills. So number seven is growth. I had to be good before I could be, I had to be bad before I could be good. And it's okay to be bad at first. We're all bad at first. I was a horrible helicopter pilot before I could fly a helicopter. And I'm sure the instructors would see that with every student. You're not a good, you're not a good pilot until you learn to fly. So each time you do it, you get better without even knowing it. In fact, it's so, your improvements happen really in small increments, but then one day, it's just like everything dials in. It's almost like a spontaneous combustion where everything you've learned along the way comes together and boom. And that's what happened to me in my network marketing business. Everything that I'd been preparing for for my first 10 years, 11 companies all came together. Like it was like a spontaneous combustion and boom, all of a sudden I was like a rocket ship. And you know what? I have not had a, other than the four months between my last company and this company, I haven't had a, you know, catastrophic blip in my business in since 1996. And um, part of that is because I continue, I have my daily habits. I continue to focus on the fundamentals. I focus on growth. I practice. I still practice. I'm practicing new things all the time. So number eight is faith. This is a big one. I had to have trust and have faith. Trust that my instructors and others who had gone before me, others who've gone before you, in this business. And you have to have trust and faith that if they can do it, you can do it. And if it's not them, it's somebody else that did it that doesn't have near the ability that you do. And when you put your trust and faith in other people that have done it, and then you learn from them, you can't help but succeed as long as you don't quit. So it's important to have faith. And to faith is what? Uh, uh, how do you define it? 
believing in things that are not seen. There's actually a definition, I don't remember it, but I should probably put it on that slide. And number nine is your dream. Living your dream is fun and it's way better than you can ever imagine. It's worth it. So when you have a big dream, when things get tough, you can always go back to your dream. And I'm going to share with you, a lot of you know the story already, but some of you don't. I'm going to share with you um, something that happened. I met a guy after I got my license and I'd been flying for a couple of years. I decided I wanted my own helicopter. So I started shopping around the country. I hired a broker, found a helicopter, uh, had it disassembled, had it reassembled in Las Vegas. It was shipped across the country. Uh, I had to put FAA certified seats in it and I had to put radios in it. From the time I found the helicopter to the time I actually flew it myself was six months. Had to go to Texas a bunch of times to get a get some special training. Uh, finally, I soloed in it after I was with after lots of anticipation and lots of excitement. I soloed in my helicopter for the first time. Well, about six months prior to that, my friend Roger introduced me to a guy, and he said this guy's been flying for twenty years. He owns multiple helicopters. He flies every week. He's got thousands of hours. Well, I got to know the guy. We hung out together for six months, came down to the airport a few times. And then uh, one day uh, I said it was in Jul July 19th, July 27th, no, June 27th, sorry, 2019. June 27th, 2019, I said, Eric, do you want to fly with me? Go out and fly my helicopter. And he said, yes. And we went down to the um, to the airport. and. We pushed my helicopter out onto the tarmac on the little helicopter pad, which was in a little bit of a confined area, which is not dangerous. It's just a confined area. There was a 150 gallon fuel tank to my left. There was a um, there was a fuel cart. There was a guy in the fuel cart. There's a parking lot on the other side of a chain link fence, and then there's a wall behind us. And uh, I it was 108 degrees that day, and I picked the helicopter up off the ramp. So we were hovering and then I turned, I asked the guy, do you want the controls? And he said, yes, it's got dual controls. He said, yes. And so I turned my controls over to him. And within a quarter of a second, the helicopter was out of control. The, it, it tipped up, the tail flipped around and hit a 150 gallon fuel tank while we were in the air. And I'm gonna let you see the crash if you haven't seen it. This was off the video surveillance cameras at the airport. I had to learn to bounce back. My crash took me, uh, nearly took me out, both physically and mentally. It didn't take me out physically. It almost took me out mentally. And here's the example. So if you look right next to the helicopter there, there's a 150 gallon fuel tank. I turned the controls over to him. He now has the controls. The guy's in that cart. The tail rotor hits the 150 gallon fuel tank. He runs, helicopter breaks into a million pieces and we come to a stop. And then within a matter of seconds, the people from inside the, the uh, hangar come out and start pulling us out of the helicopter. We're standing there in this heap of wreckage and there's fuel, like a big puddle of fuel all around. Um, and my face was actually literally sitting in the fuel on the concrete, which was probably 120 degrees. I burned my shoulder, got some stitches in my left foot. There were paramedics. There were news choppers overhead, the FAA that was there, the NTSB was there, and he disappeared. The guy disappeared. And we were all looking, the FAA wanted to talk to him and interview him. And I texted him and I said, Eric, the FAA is here. They need to talk to you. He didn't even say goodbye. He just left. And I didn't know, maybe he was in shock. I didn't know what, what happened, but he disappeared. And uh, they chased him for five weeks. He kept saying he had his license. He had his logbook. He has everything. He'll get it to them. For five weeks, the FAA chased him. Finally, they tracked him down. They got him into the office. And in the office, he said, I lied. I've never flown a helicopter in my life. Everybody in my life knows me as a licensed pilot, but I've never flown. And um, he, um, he wrote a report. If you go on YouTube and you put in fake helicopter pilot crashes helicopter, fake helicopter pilot crashes helicopter, you'll see this crash video. You'll see my accident report to the FAA, you'll see his handwritten accident report to the FAA, which matches mine about him being a liar and how he lied to me and all the other pilots and the mechanics and all his friends and his girlfriend and his mom and everybody for years and years and years. And uh, <clears throat> they told me they were going to do an investigation 
<clears throat> a one-year investigation. And then after that, they told me they were going to arrest him because it is a felony. A uh, day and a half later, the pandemic was announced and hit, and they shut everything down, including the FAA offices. And he's got nothing. He owns no helicopters. He doesn't even own the car that he drives, but he got home. He got scot free because two years later, when I contacted the FAA, they said they pretty much just cleared off their desk and started from scratch. So that was uh, my helicopter story. But the bottom line is that was my dream. This was a big dream. It was so big that not even a crash was going to take me out. I needed to get back up on the horse. And so four months later, I went to uh, my friend, Brian Lorenz, who's a certified flight instructor. And I said, Brian, would you take me up? I'm scared out of my mind, but I need to get back up in the helicopter. And we got in the helicopter and uh, he was just there as my emotional support, but I did everything. And I, I really, just as you can tip it off, just, um, that's it. So the crash was on June 27, 2019, and I flew again on December 23rd, 2019. And I've probably flown 60 times since then. I take people up. I took a couple of friends of mine up last week, and we flew around Red Rock and just had a blast. So uh, those are the 10 lessons. Um, the last lesson is that when you get knocked down, you're going to get knocked down hard. <clears throat> There's really no way around that. When you get knocked down, it's important to get back up on the horse and not let that be your demise. Your dream needs to remain intact and you need to remind yourself why you got started in the first time, uh, why you got started in the first place. And that's probably gonna happen to you many, many times in your career where something's gonna take you out and then you're gonna have to say, my dream is more important than my fears. I need to face my fears, break through those and get back up on the horse. So with that, that's really the principles that got me out of that rental at the age of 34 years old and brought me to where I am today. And I hope that some of you found some lessons in the training tonight. And I just appreciate all of you. And I appreciate you stopping by tonight to hang out with me. And uh, you guys all have a great week. Take care. Bye.